start with prayer. Father, we are so privileged and honored that we can come before you, that you love us and care for us, that you want to be in a relationship with us, and even when we were enemies, that you sent your son to die for our sins, to put us back into a right relationship with you, and that you would want us to call you Father. We just thank you and praise you for that. Lord, as we read your word today, open up our hearts and minds that we may understand the scriptures that you have for us and that we may see that it is all about Jesus and how we need you, God. We just praise your holy name today. We pray for those that are not with us today, that you bring them back safely. And Lord, help us to be a light to this world. We just pray for our community, for our country, Lord, and may we be the stewards that you have given us all these wonderful graces, grace upon grace. May we use that time wisely to serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I wish Sarah was here today. We talked about this whew, nearly a year ago. We were talking about this passage. And I said, we'll get to it soon. And she was in Coeur d'Alene and stuff. And now she's back up here, but she's not here today. So she'll have to make sure she sees it. What does this passage mean? This is a tough passage. I could just say, let's skip it. But that wouldn't be what Jesus did, would it? Wouldn't be following his example. What do these things mean? Are these warnings to us? Or are these about rewards? Are they a combination of both? Do they apply to me? Do they apply to you? Do they apply just to people in leadership? What is Jesus saying here? So does this apply to me? That was the question that Peter is asking. And he's asking it from what we went over last week. The, the different parables that were given there with the examples that you can be like the... Uh, house owner that protects his home because he doesn't want a thief to come in the middle of the night so he's ready and waiting. Or you can be like the wise and uh, prudent servant who is ready for his master's return. He knows that his master's gone away and it'll be a while before he returns. He doesn't know when but he's got his responsibilities to do. He has been left in charge of all of his master's possessions. He is there still to serve, not to goof off, not to use his master's goods unwisely but to manage them well so that when his master returns he'll be dressed and ready to serve him and the lamps will be burning bright because it may be even late in the morning before he comes home at any given time and they need to be dressed ready to serve doing what they should have been doing being good stewards of all that God has given them now that's sobering just to stop there because that's us 
Jesus left to prepare a place for us. He said, don't worry, don't fear, I have left. And he said that in Luke just prior to this. Not to worry, not to be concerned about the things of this world. Not even what you eat or drink or anything, which if you look at the, the TV and the magazines, that's what people are worried about, how they look, what they wear, social status and everything. This is still the same things today. The young man had interjected just a few verses back and he said, Father, or Jesus, he said, tell my brother to give me my inheritance now so I can have the things of this world. But Jesus had already taught plainly that we need to build up treasures in heaven, not treasures here on earth. But we have a loving Father that wants to give us everything so that we can use it wisely and be rich towards Him. He is the giver of all good things. The reason that we can preach the Word of God in peace today is because of Jesus Christ, because of God's will here, what Jesus has accomplished. The words of the song said, How we need you, God. Could you imagine if he just said, Forget it, I'm done. Or if he just destroyed us. If he was out of this world, we would destroy ourselves, wouldn't we? Without God, there would be no love. There would be no kindness, no joy, no peace. Because all that comes from God. And what's waiting here is the Master's return and how he judges these servants for the job that they've done while he was away. That's us again. What you're doing with your life while Jesus is away preparing your home. So in Luke 12 verse 41, Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Why did Peter ask that? Who is Jesus talking to? Surely he's not talking to me. He's got to be just talking to the Peters of this world. Maybe he's talking to me, Alan, because I've taken on a role as pastor. But surely he's not talking to each one of you, right? Or is he? Is he talking to all disciples, those that will come after and follow him? You know the master's will then. Did he not leave you behind as a servant? You've got to go back and remember in scriptures, Jesus never refers to us as Christians. He refers to people that follow him as his disciples usually. Because they are learning after the Master's way to live a life, to obey those teachings and to follow in the footsteps of the Master, teaching others. And what we have to teach here is that salvation comes through other, no other name than Jesus Christ. That He is the way, the truth, and the life. And that God loves them so much that, they, that He sent His only Son to die for their sins. What a message that we have to proclaim. What a privilege. What urgency we have. It wasn't until middle of Acts that Luke records that Christians were first called Christians, disciples were first called Christians in Antioch because they were acting and behaving like Christ. It was something that Barnabas saw and was just overwhelmed with, so he had to get Paul and said, you've got to come see this. Disciples are finally living as a body of believers living as Christ. Not worrying about the things of this world. That's why so many people sold all the land that they had and possessions they had and lived in common. That's not Christian communism. That's not what heaven's going to be like. Don't think it, it is. Because sometimes we forget that and we forget to look at all the teaching that Jesus talks about rewarding those good and faithful servants. But Jesus talks a little bit here about cutting some in two, doesn't he? So that's kind of disturbing. But let's look at the passage further and see. But how is a, a disciple supposed to live? Luke 9, 23 says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, must take up their cross daily, and follow me. A few le verses later, uh, Luke records in verse 62 of chapter 9, No one who has put a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of heaven. He's serious about what he's saying. If you decide that you're going to come after and follow me, that is what I require. Total servitude. Not just out of pastors, but out of everyone who says, Lord, Lord. If you believe that God loved you and gave His Son to die for you and you accept that, then you are called into servitude to tell the gospel message, to live a life accordingly to Jesus Christ. Not to do it later, not to do it when you feel called, but to do it from that point on. To study scriptures so that you'll be an approved workman. To realize that you're fighting a spiritual battle. To realize that you are ambassadors of Christ, living in a foreign land, proclaiming the word of God about the kingdom of heaven, which has come to earth, but will be forevermore perfect in eternity for those who trust in Jesus. 
Matthew records in verse t- chapter 10, verse 38, it says, whoever, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. These teachings are a little tougher. We like to go with the good ones because they're, they're nice. But the tough ones keep us straight, don't they? Doesn't a good parent discipline his child because it's best for the child? We don't want to see our children go down the wrong paths, so we discipline them. If we don't give out the discipline we need, so many times they suffer as a result for us not being the parent that we should have been in the first place. So what does this mean to you, taking up your cross daily? It means it's going to be painful. It means it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. But it's going to be worth it. And you're equipped and empowered because Jesus says, after He says that He's going away, He says, don't worry, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will ask the Father to send the Comforter so that He will comfort you and equip you and empower you for anything that you face in life. God Himself residing inside of you. The thing that the author of Hebrews says that the Old Testament saints long to see, the fact that they didn't have to experience the Holy Spirit coming on some individuals here and there or coming upon the nation, but anyone who chose to follow after Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in you and gives you total peace, confidence, hope that you've never understood before, that you are a child of God and that nothing can separate you from God because of the love of Christ Jesus that's in you. So you have to repent Change your way of thinking. Decide that you're not going to live your life for yourself, no matter how much the media says you deserve to break today or anything else or have it your way. That your life is God's. He created and designed you. Again, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If I created something, a watch, I want it to do what I did. If it doesn't keep time accordingly, it's worthless, isn't it? I might keep it and throw it in the drawer drawer, and it still might be mine, or I might totally get rid of it because it's not serving the purpose that I created. But God, when we were His enemies, not doing what He asked, that we sinned and rebelled against Him, said, I want my will instead of your will. He said, I love you, and I'm going to pour mercy out on you. I'm going to send my Son to do what you can't do to make the way right for you. All you've got to do is believe in Him. And if you believe in Him... He repurchases you back or ransoms you from an eternity apart from God in a place of torment called hell. That's how much He loves you. He says, this worthless watch, I'm going to repurchase back and make it my own. So it's time for the watch not to be worthless, isn't it? To realize what happened there. To realize the gift that you have because of who God is and His love for you. So why would you not want to boldly proclaim the message of Jesus Christ? Going back to Luke 9, 23. He said to them all, notice the words all. Not just to the Peters and the Pauls, but He said to them all. Whoever, anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow after me. That's a command to all believers. Then he continued and said in verse 24, For whoever, anyone, who wants to save their life, who wants eternal life rather than eternal death, will lose their life. Whoever loses their life for me will save it for all eternity. I hear Christians say sometimes, well... You know, I don't feel that God has called me to do this or that. Yes, He did when, he, when you accepted Him as Lord and Savior. Or at least accepted Him as Savior. Maybe you didn't understand the Lord part yet. He called you to be His servant. To be in ministry for Christ. To join with a body of believers and serve in that church and serve outside of that church. Not to say, oh, I'm not going to be a part of until I feel this way or that way. That was part of your initial indoctrination. You are to serve God. It's understood if that's what you want to be for a disciple. If you hold on to that old life, Jesus says here, you're going to lose an eternity in heaven. You're not going to gain it. Maybe you're not who you think you are, hypocrite. He said it quite often throughout the New Testament. But then he said, whoa, because he wanted them to come to him. Even though they thought their religious works of righteousness would would do it and cut through and be good enough. Verse 25 says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world 
everything possible in this world. All riches, all power, all wealth, all prestige. Yet lose their very soul or self. We get caught up in Satan's lie. We fight a spiritual battle. And that's on a battlefront that never ends. He wants to steal God's glory in your worship. So are you holding on to this world or are you letting go? Are you living a life that Christ taught and demonstrated? Are you living for God's will or for Alan's will? And you can put your name in there. To look at the verse in Matthew, Matthew 10, 38, we'll start in verse 37. It says, Anyone again who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus wants your total love and devotion over everything. Anyone who loves their sons, son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This isn't a bad thing. This is just saying, I want to be your total beloved that you love me more than anything. And then all this other will flow right because you understand how to love in the first place. You understand about being a godly parent or a godly child or whatever it is in your relationships or in a God fashion, God designed the way He had designed and intended instead of trying to do things and fix things on your own. Verse 38, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Verse 39, whoever finds their life understands this will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Jesus is pretty clear about who wants to be His disciple. Who forsakes all and comes and follows after Him. He never teaches half-hearted obedience. He never teaches half-hearted faith, half-hearted commitment. He taught total servitude. Total obedience. My life is not my own. It was repurchased back by the mercy of God in the first place. Why would He love me that much? I rebelled and sinned against Him. The creation against the Creator. But He loved me enough to say, I still want a relationship with you. And not just a relationship. Now I want to call you son or daughter. Christians are called to be humble, obedient servants. And Jesus even calls us friends because we understand the will of the Father. Paul knew this well. He talked about it in Acts. Acts chapter 20, starting verse 19, says, I serve the Lord with great humility, with tears and in the midst of severe testings by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. He didn't fear death, imprisonment, anything else. He knew what his task was. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. But God called him there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race because there's only a certain amount of time. There is a goal at the end. There usually are prizes and awards and accolades and prestige. <clears throat> and to complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. What task is that? And you need to be asking yourself that. If you're not sure where He wants you to serve and how He wants you to serve, be asking for that clarity. Be asking for those uh, options in your life. That, that He'll bring those forward so that you can serve Him and you can serve Him wisely. And it says here what the task is. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's the task before every Christian. God is our Creator and He is our purchaser back. He should be our complete God and Jesus Christ should be our master, teacher, Lord. We should follow after Him. If we don't, do we truly believe? We're going to see that in the scripture here. Did you know two-thirds of the people in the United States that have gym memberships don't use them? That only means that one-third of the people that pay their good hard money to go to the gym to get a benefit out of that, whether it's to get in health or to get muscular or tone or if it's just socializing, whatever it is. 
Two-thirds of the people that pay their hard-earned money to do that don't even use their membership. You are all members of the family of God. What are you doing with your membership? Oh, it didn't cost me anything, did it? Who did it cost and what did it cost him? It cost God and His Son everything to save you. What are you doing with the membership that you have in the kingdom of God? Not just members, but sons and daughters of the Most High. Jesus answered Peter's question in Luke 12, verse 42. He said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? Uh, Jesus has to answer the question with a question so that you think, so that you study God's Word, so that you can find the answer here. It's not just clear. It's to those who want to study God's Word to see their will for their life, to understand Scripture. Who is? And to see they're supposed to give their food allowance at the proper time. So certainly it's just got to apply to the Peters and the Pauls and those who take up full-time ministry, right? Isn't every Christian called to give a food allowance to someone at some time? You probably look back and think in the last few days where God said, hmm, I need to go make amends with this person. Or I should stop by and see this person and check on them and see how they're doing. Bill, didn't Barry reach out to you and check on you this week? And Bill's here today. Because we all are given the Spirit of God to reach out and to feed our brothers and sisters and the lost. The thing here is we see the word master or steward. Whom then is the master or steward? And we want to focus on that and say certainly it's someone who's just been put in charge of a bunch of other people. But if you look at scriptures, you'll see that we are all masters and stewards. So who was Jesus talking to? If you look in your Bibles at Luke 12, I'll run through it again just so you see. And He doesn't change who it is. And then I'll reinforce that by Peter's own words when he writes his gospel. In Luke 12 verse 1 it says, There was a crowd of thousands... And Jesus began first to speak to His disciples, not the twelve, but all those that came to truly follow after Him. Now in those that came truly to follow after Him, there's going to be some hypocrites, right? We've seen that in Scripture. There are going to be some that say, Lord, Lord, who don't know Him. There are going to be many many that profess in this world today to be a Christian, and when you get to talking to them about how that is, because my mom and dad went to church. Ah, I don't think that's going to work. Because I am a citizen of the United States. That's not going to work. Because I trust in Jesus. Maybe. What are you doing with your life? Jesus tells us by their fruits you will know them. So maybe that will work. Maybe that won't. Maybe you have fire insurance. But I can tell you again that it's not going to be just good to get to heaven. It's going to be good for those who worked accordingly that their father says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the praise you want to receive. Not just, you made it, you're here. He's looking for those, and look at Jesus' words. Go home and study them all. He looks for those who are obedient. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son. That Whosoever believes in Him, that's all we have to have is that faith. But if we truly have that faith, then we know that our life is not our own and we're sold out to tell others about the joy that's inside of us, to live that life. Verse 4 says, friends. Jesus says, friends, those who knows the Father's will. Verse 13, we have the man that interrupts Jesus in this course of things. And Jesus responds with the parable of the rich fool. That's to everyone again to hear. Everyone is welcome to be my disciple. The good news is for all people. But there's some of here, you here today that will hear my words. There's some that will fall on good soil and produce a crop. There's some that will fall by the wayside and then they'll, they'll sprout up. Well, the wayside is trampled down. They'll fall on rocky ground, not have enough soil. We can go back to that and see Jesus' words all throughout. So he's teaching all of them here, you don't have to worry about the things of this world. Don't worry about it. Your Father in heaven loves you so much. And he gives the parable of the rich fool. Then in verse 22, Jesus turns His attention back to those who call themselves disciples. And all the next teachings are the same. They don't change the audience. There's nowhere in there that we see a difference. But see, Peter asked, Are you talking to me? Are you talking to the twelve? Now this is my view. 
So I always throw that in there. Or are you talking to all these people? Because I want to be the greatest. They've already had this argument. And Jesus did not condone them, I mean, did not condemn them for having this argument. He answered them and said, if you want to be the greatest, you need to be the least in this earth so that you'll be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So it's not a bad thing for Peter to want to be the greatest. He's like, am I going to have to share this with everybody? And Jesus is telling him, you're going to have to share it with everybody who is faithful because they followed after me and gave up this world for me just as you did. Hopefully that's a lot of people. Certainly I hope it's not the twelve. And of course I'm throwing in whoever the twelfth is after Judas whether it's Paul or Matthias or who it is. But certainly there are Christians that have gave up this world to follow after Jesus. And we know plenty that have. But where do we stand there? He wanted to know if he would be the greatest or if he would be sharing this. In Mark 9, verses 33 to 35, they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet. Because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. See, they were worried that Jesus was going to scold them. But He didn't. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve aside and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. There's no scold, no condemnation there. Because we need to realize that, that heaven is a place where we are going to be rewarded for what we've done with our lives here. God purchased them back. He gave us abilities. In the United States, He has made us rich with freedom, with, op with opportunity to find His Word. All you've got to do is pick up your phone and look, and you can get all kind of translations of your Bible. Or you can pick it up and start gossiping. Or you can pick it up and look at porn. It's all right there. God's Word is available to you. Commentaries are available to you like no other generation before. So what are you doing with that? Are you studying to be an approved workman? Are you telling others about Jesus Christ? When you have read something in your phone, do you share it with someone else? Sherry got a, her ear fixed this week. We went to a tattoo shop. She said, did you notice all the stuff on the wall? I'm like, no. She said, it's pretty bad because it's not necessarily a godly place. I'm not condemning them. I said, I was reading my Bible because I was sitting there on my phone reading my Bible. I had no idea of the war that was going around, around me spiritually because I was sitting there reading God's Word, studying so that I could bring this to you. Because I have my phone available where I'm at and I have time, I can read God's Word and study it. Jesus doesn't scold them. He says, here's what you need to do. Well, here's another account in Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4. It says, At the time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, get this, you're not going to really understand this or believe this, but here's the answer. Unless you change and become like little children who rely totally on their father's dependence, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Total trust in your father in heaven. Therefore, tying this back together, since you understand this or you've heard this at least, Whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, maybe you don't want to believe in rewards. Maybe you want to believe in Christian communism when we get to heaven. Everybody's equal because they made it. But Jesus said here that there's someone who's going to be greatest. So shouldn't we work for that? Not because that's our driving ambition, but because we want to please our Father in heaven. In Luke, which we've gone over in chapter 9, verses 46 through 48, it says an argument started among the disciples to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. So he goes even further with that analogy. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is the least among you all who is the greatest. So not only that, is we should welcome anyone who seems to be the least of these out in the world because Jesus Christ died for all of them. We're not to be prideful. We're supposed to wash the feet of even the one that might betray us. That's exactly what Jesus did. Just a few verses later, Jesus does rebuke His disciples for what's in their heart. In verse 51 it says, As the time approached for Him to be taken up to heaven, and that's where we've started studying because these are the final teachings of Jesus, Jesus res resolutely set out for Jerusalem and He sent messengers on ahead. 
who went into a Samarian, Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? What happens? Verse 55, but Jesus turned and rebuked them. He rebukes us for what we do wrong, and never once did He rebuke anyone for wanting to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's something that we should desire to be, to bring glory and honor to God, to build up eternal riches rather than build up treasure on earth where mobs destroy and st thieves steal. It's what we're supposed to do. We're missing out if we think that I'll just get by and I'll make it to heaven and everything will be great. That's not what Jesus taught. Matthew 6, one of Jesus' first teachings, the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 19 says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Don't do it. Where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But the complete opposite. Do this. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Peter was saying, this is my heart. Maybe I don't want everyone to share it with me. Maybe I do, but I'm going to hear Jesus' words from this and I'm going to understand that it is for everyone. And I'm going to be proud that they have these rewards in heaven. I'm going to want to teach them and show them the way. And that's what Jesus is saying. This is not only for you, Peter. This is for anyone who really believes and says that they will come and follow me. <clears throat> so who is that faithful and wise manager? The King James Version says steward. Like I said, if you just look at those definitions, nine times out of ten, you'll get someone who's put in charge of someone else. But don't let Satan deceive you there because it's for everyone. And like I told you that Peter would even understand this later. So I'm going to show it to you. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Therefore, since Christ suffered in His body, arm yourself also with the same attitude. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God, what we just learned here from Jesus' teaching. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry, they are, they are surprised that you did not join with them in their reckless living, reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in, in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Exactly what Jesus is teaching. Remember I told you last week, this is the first time that Luke records that Jesus is talking about His return back. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply. We've got to love. They will not be known there by our love because love covers over a multitude of sin. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you, doesn't that mean everyone? Each of you, not just the twelve, not just pastors, not just Sunday school teachers, not Awana's leaders, but everyone who says, Lord, Lord, should use whatever gift they have received to serve others as faithful stewards. Same word. We are all stewards of what God's given us. Peter may not have understood it that day, but he understood it later when he got out and started serving. And he lived the life that Jesus proclaimed. Faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So I hope I've made it clear that he's talking to all of us. So we've answered that. So now we've got to dig in and see what's said here because it's tough. Verse 43, it will be good. And if you remember for last week, that means blessed. And he's already said it two times. It will be good now a third time, or you will be blessed for that servant whose master finds him so doing when he returns. These are the ones that are faithful, who are working, who are dressed, who have had their lamps burning, who realize that they are in charge of things. 
All these things that God has given them to be good stewards of it. Verse 44, Truly I tell you again, because this is going to get a little harder or crazier or whatever it is, He will put him in charge of all his possessions. Jesus has already said, If you're dressed waiting ready to serve me, when I come back, I'm going to serve you. <laughs> wow. And now he says, if you've been a good steward of what I've put you in charge of, I'm going to put you in charge of all of my possessions. Wow, what an opportunity for the good, faithful, wise steward, servant, master. Don't that, don't that want to be you? Don't you want that to be? I want that to be me. Truly I tell you, there will be rewards in heaven for the wise steward, right? Doesn't that also imply that the unwise and unfaithful steward will not be put in charge? We don't like to think that part because we like to think heaven is great. So we think spiritual communism. We also think it's just floating around on a cloud. And I guarantee you that's not true either. Playing a harp, right? Because we see what the media says. Stuff. So then we get people say, well... I don't know if heaven's a place I want to go because it's going to be boring, but I guess it's better than the other place. I don't think they're going to get in. You notice in your bulletin there's the woman arguing. What do you mean I'm not getting in? I don't think we'll be able to say that. I think when the time comes, we'll know. Everyone will know. Every knee will bow. <clears throat> that's the guy I want to be. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, the guy that's the good steward. What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. They will know that you are Christians by your love. Not by what you say, but by what you do, the life you live, how much you love others, even your enemies. Even those who take your shirt and you say here, or your jacket and you say, here's my shirt also, which means I'm naked, but I'm not naked because I'm clothed in righteousness. So going on, verse 45 says, but suppose, so now we have the opposite. The NLT says, what if the servant says to himself? King James Version says, in his heart, because that's where we make the decisions from, from our heart. My master is taking a long time. Well, I thought that I wanted this Christianity part. But maybe I'm not so sure. And, second thing, because he's thought in his heart that there is no God, or he's thought in his heart there's another way, another truth, another life, or that his master's taking long, I have plenty of time to do God's will. I'll do mine now. Whatever, whatever this means. He's deceived. Who's the author of all lies but Satan who's just trying to destroy and steal your worship? He then begins to beat the other servants, whatever this means. It's the opposite of God's will, is it not? Whether it's beating them by physically going out and beating them, or if it's by not when the Spirit pricks your heart and you don't go by and see Bill when you know that the Spirit pricked your heart to do that. Because he's here today. Both men and women he beats, and then he eats and drinks and gets drunk. We're supposed to get drunk in the spirit, are we not? Not drunk on the things of the world. Not to worry about the things of this world. Verse 46, the master of that servant, clear again who's the master and who's the servant, will come. And he will come on a day that he does not expect him, and an hour he's not aware of. Jesus has already taught us this from the previous. But now here, woo! He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with unbelievers. That's what Sarah and I were talking about way back then. What does that mean? Well, it's pretty clear to me, and I feel pretty confident so I can tell you this. And you look through commentaries and it'll tell you a lot of different things. But those people were simply hypocrites. That's what Jesus is teaching, teach. You might say you're a servant. You might hang out with the servants. But when you quit, and you can't quit the job of a servant because you're owned by someone else, you're not really a servant, are you? And we know from Scripture 
that nothing can separate us from God's love. But these people are cut in half and thrown into the place with unbelievers. The word literally means without faith. By faith you believe and are justified. So these were people who said they were, but they weren't. Now there's a lot of those people and we need to witness to them as well. I'm sure there are people all throughout this country who have already said that, that go to church and proclaim to know Jesus Christ. But number one, do their work show it? And number two, I need to love them regardless and not condemn them. And show them by my works and my actions. Because we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ when He returns. Not the great white throne judgment. To get the rewards or whatever else is tied to them when He returns. They are hypocrites. They will be exposed when Jesus returns. I went over Jesus' preaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Here's part of that same sermon again. From Matthew 7, 15 through 23. Watch out for false prophets, those who claim to be believers but are not, right? They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly in their heart they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. And that's confusing because sometimes their fruit looks good. On the outside we buy peaches all the time, and I don't know what's up with peaches now. But half the time you get a peach and you cut it open, it's gross inside. I don't know if it's, I thought it's because they were getting... Frostbit some here and there, but when I buy a peach, it's a crapshoot whether it's going to be a good peach or not. So when we look at Christians and look at their fruit, so-called Christians, we've got to look at their heart. But it's not ours to judge again. Don't get off on that. But you will recognize a fruit. It might take a little cutting into, a little time spent with them, a little time in prayer and spending together in, in worship and, and Bible studies. But we're supposed to be providing the meat for even them. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree does bear good fruit. Not just fruit, but good fruit. It might take tasting to see. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? He's just teaching what he's already taught from the beginning. Cut down and thrown into the fire. It doesn't matter if you say, Lord, Lord. It doesn't matter if you say you're a Christian. It doesn't matter if you go to church or your parents went to church. It matters if you believe in your heart and truly accept Jesus Christ, then you are justified and set free from your sins. Thus, he says it again, by their fruit you will recognize them. Those are sobering words just like Jesus says here. Verse 21 says what I've been saying all throughout this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only who? The ones who do the will of my Father in heaven. Tie this right to Luke where we're studying, which is a future teaching of Jesus in His last days. You may call yourself a Christian. You may cry out, Lord, Lord. But if you're not doing the master's business, when I return, it will be exposed. And that one who called himself a servant, but was not, will be cut in two and placed in with the unbelievers. I don't know what that means. Maybe it's a, t a difference of shame that you'll know. Not only were you a sinner who did, wasn't saved by grace, but you proclaimed to be something else. So you're in heaven, sown in two, I mean, heaven, hell, sown in two. I don't know what it means. And I don't think we need to go down that road. It just means that when the master returns, you will be exposed for what you are or for what you are not. Many, not a few, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles. So these were people that, that looking at them, they did things that I wish I could say I have done. I wish God's power was in there doing that for me. But then I will tell them plainly, I never knew from me. Away from you, you evil doers. The servant that is said there in verse 45 and 46, even though the word servant is used, is a fake servant. Don't ever think it is a child of God because they were exposed. Children of God are not sown in two and thrown into hell. You have hope and peace above all that you are God's child and you will spend an eternity in heaven if that is what you truly believe. 
So we have two groups so far. One who is a good, faithful, and wise servant, ready, lamps burning bright, and now doing his master's will, right? Serving others. And then you have two, group two, servants who really aren't servants at all. But wait a minute, we've got to go further. <laughs> group one's the only option, right, so far? Maybe group three and four will look good to you. Verse 47 and 48. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. Verse 48, but the one who does not know and does things still deserving of punishment will still be beaten, but with few blows. Do you want to be a part of group three or four? I don't. Now again, we can sit there and say, well, who are these? But it really doesn't matter to what Jesus is teaching. You don't want to be in group three or four. If you don't want to be in group three or four, and Jesus has come to you and you're here in church and you've heard these words, then you know what you're supposed to do. Are you doing it? Because the servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready and does not do what the master wants because it's not your life, it's his. It's not my will, but thine, Lord. You will be beaten with many blows. Okay? You're the one who does not know. You don't know all things because you've not studied, but you've heard the word of Christ that says, come and follow after me. And you do things still deserving punishment because there are none righteous, no, not one, and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You'll still be beaten, but with few blows. Well, I'd rather be that guy, but I don't want a beating. So whether this person makes it to heaven or doesn't make it to heaven, you don't want to be this person. So we don't need to dwell on this. There are so many things as I've studied who these people are. I see that they still have a relationship with their master. It was never severed. So maybe they went to heaven. Maybe that's part of that judgment. Will we all stand accountable for the things we've done with this life? I don't know. I'm not going to try to convince you that I know one way or the other. But what I do know and what I am going to try to get to you is be that good, faithful, wise steward. Dressed, serving, lamps burning, doing what you know you should be doing. Not saying I'll do it later because later might not come. And if later doesn't come, were you really a servant at all? That's what Jesus is saying here. When it does happen and Jesus does return, because that's the point of what He's saying here too, there's no time left for correction or attitude adjustment. If that was a Christian in those last two verses, then they're going to face that consequence that they lived a worthless life. If they weren't a Christian, they're going to face a consequence in eternity in hell. You don't want to be a part of that group. You don't want to be a fake servant. You want to be only group A. Going back to the soils, you want to be only the soil that produces a healthy crop. That's the only option there. Serve well with all your heart, all your mind, all your body, all your soul. Have you heard that before? And you won't have anything to worry about when Jesus Christ, your Master, returns. It will all be rewards and accolations and feasts that He's prepared for you. And well done, my good and faithful servant. The last part of verse 48 says, From everyone who has been given much, is that you? <clears throat> much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, we get to the stewardship part, much more will be asked. As Christians... You fall in this category. As Christians in the United States, you fall in this category even more because you have the freedoms and things that other Christians in the world don't have. With the technology and everything of the time and age that you're in, you fall into this category even more. So what's your answer? Are you going to live a life worthy? Are you going to live a life for God's will? Or are you going to live a life that's unworthy and for your own will? Mark 13, verse 32 through 37 reads this way, and these are all words in red. But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on your guard. That's not where he's done. That's an exclamation point, a warning. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge. Each 
with their assigned task. And tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back. It's his house, his kingdom. And it matters for all eternity. Whether it's in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn even. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping, unaware, not doing what you should be doing, but awake, ready. What I say to you, I say to everyone. We're not talking to Peter, the apostles, those in leadership in the church. We're talking to everyone. Here's your warning again. Watch. So here's a few questions. First, are you a true servant? That's the first question to ask. Are you playing a game? Because it will be exposed. Are you building up treasures on earth? Or are you building up in heaven? Because you can be a true servant and still not be building up those treasures. Are you wise and faithful steward? Because that means even more. You may be building up treasures, but you're doing it half-heartedly and you're missing out on a lot, of, a lot of times and you're not using this life that He's repurchased back for you wisely and faithfully, making the best decisions of the limited time that you have because we don't know if it'll be tomorrow or not. And when we say, ah, it won't be tomorrow, we just increased the probability, didn't we? There are no do-overs, no second chances. Are you ready to meet Jesus Christ, your Lord and Master? I hope and pray everyone here. That's why I can teach this. Even though it's hard words, it's not going to get me a popularity contest. But what it is going to do is he's going to say, Well done, my wise and faithful servant. And that's what I want to live my life for. And I hope that's what you want to live your life for. Father, we thank you so much that you are such a gracious, loving God. That you are our Father in heaven. That we are your children. Saved by your mercy and grace through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our Master who teaches us. Help us to long to hear His words. To put them to heart. To put them to practice. So that we may live a, a worthy life. But even more of that. So that others may come to know Jesus Christ and be saved. Saving it from eternity apart from you. A place of torment and hell that they can spend eternity and that you've given us that privilege to live our lives, to help guide them along the way. Help us to be lights, especially in our home and our community, Lord, and help us to reach out further and further and further with the gospel message as you gave us that plan where you said to go to the other ends of the earth and to teach and preach the gospel message and to make and train up disciples. Lord, help us not be something that we know that, that we quote it, but it, to be a life motto that we bring glory and honor to you. I pray for everyone here that they know you personally as their, as their God. Jesus Christ is their Savior. And beyond that, make Him Lord of their life. If there's any convictions, any things holding them back, Lord, I pray that you bind Satan and his demons from this place, that you fill us with your Spirit, and that your Spirit guides us home so that we can be ready and waiting when Jesus returns and makes all things right. We just thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. And we thank you that you loved us enough that you let Jesus sacrifice his life for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.